Hey y'all, welcome to Homegrown KC, a podcast dedicated to exploring Kansas City's fascinating history and sharing stories from a church past. I'm your host, Laura. Join me today as we explore a piece of Kansas City's history. Hey y'all, happy holidays. Is everybody over their turkey food coma by now? It's been a little over a week, so I hope you are. If you're not, I hope you still had a good holiday. They can get weird with family stuff, but you know if you don't celebrate for whatever reason, I hope you went outside because we had gorgeous weather last week. Um, not this past week though, where the weather couldn't decide if it wanted to be 20 degrees or 50 degrees. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I, um, I went to the mayor's Christmas tree lighting ceremony at Crown Center, um, on Friday, and I didn't get a video of the fireworks for y'all like I have in the years past because my camera just wouldn't focus, so I nixed it. But I did get a couple photos of the trees, those are up on my social media pages, and the band was so good this year, I don't know who that was, but way better than the past couple years. Like, last year, I think, was the one where they had the children's choir, and I'm sorry, but I kind of hate children's choirs because they just don't sound very good. Anyways, welcome back. Uh, the last episode that I released was a couple of weeks ago, um, and at the time I realized I had forgotten to release the November newsletter. And I was already halfway through November, so I decided to wait and y'all would just get the December newsletter, which I'm not done yet. Usually it's on the 1st. Um, I decided to wait until I released this episode and then I would write the newsletter. So you will be getting that this afternoon if you subscribe. This is the last topic of the year. It's not the last topic of the series. I am going to finish this up in 2023. And that topic will be the Folly Theater. I will have my year 2022 interview on December 31st as well. And speaking of December 31st, that will be the very, very last day that you can listen to Redlined KC unless you are a patron subscriber. Um, that episode is um, a conversation that I had with Andrew Gustafson from the Johnson County, um, try again, Johnson County Museum, um, and we talked about the history of redlining in America, specifically here in Kansas City. And one more thing, I will probably have one more adventure minisode. That will depend on which museum or exhibit my friend Ethan and I visit when he comes to town in a couple of weeks. Looking forward to seeing you. So here we go. Today's topic, part two of topic two, the opera houses of series six, historic theaters. And today's topic is all about the Gillis Opera House. So recap from part one, and I guess you could listen to part one or part two of this topic in either order, but I do always recommend you listen to part one first. Um, in part one, I talked about the Coates Opera House, which opened in 1870. That was courtesy of Kersey Coates. A little bit of a tongue twister there for you if you tried to say that five times fast. The Gillis Opera House opened up a few years later on September 10th in 1883. So guess what? Instant competition. Because, as I was trying to describe for you last uh, episode... Kansas City in the 1800s is basically considered the boondocks. Nobody wants to come here. It's too far west, it's too expensive to get there, and it's dirty and unsophisticated. Why would you want to come to Kansas City? So now that a few troops have come to Kansas City and will continue to come to Kansas City, now they have two options to choose from. So, I mean, that's good from them. They can be like, hey, the other one will pay me more and you know, maybe get a better deal. The theater is connected to a couple of very big family names here in Kansas City. Um, the Gillis Opera House, the creation of it is due to Mary Troost. She was the wife of Dr. Benoit Troost, for whom Troost Avenue is named. I mentioned Troost Avenue in my topic, A City Divided from Series 3, hashtag Black Lives Matter. 
So if you have listened to that episode, then you'll know that truce became the racial and economic divide of the city in the 1950s. If you have not listened to Series 3, please do so. Um, just so you know, there is a sensitivity warning on the whole series because I talk, I cover some very serious topics like racism, slavery, uh, lynching, and other similar topics. But I'm pretty proud of that series, so please listen to it. Anyway, um, this past summer, 2022... Business owners along Truce began a campaign, which I think all Kansas Cityans ought to be supporting, and what they want to do is change the name of Truce Avenue to Truth Avenue, because Dr. Truce was not without controversy. He was born in Holland and moved to Kansas City after he moved to America, and, you know, he was the city's first doctor, and he helped establish the city and, and did some good things. But he also owned enslaved individuals, so they're like really not great. That kind of overshadows the good stuff. Mary Ann Gillis Troost, and I have to put in a apology here at the beginning of this. This kind of pisses me off. I could find like zero online sources for Mary and her biography. I'm sure that the Missouri Valley has something in their files, but I completely forgot to look her up when I went and did my research, and I only looked up the theater. Um, so my dear loyal listeners, I am so, 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 so sorry. Super apologize. I'm going to really have to do a deep dive on her in another series. The very little I found out about her is this. She was born sometime in 1812 in Maryland. No idea who her parents are, how many siblings she had. She married George Kernley. Uh, Kenner, oh, sorry, I said that wrong. Kennerly in 1830. In Maryland, she was 18 at the time. They moved to Kansas City in 1835, and she divorced him for being, quote, a perpetual drunkard, end quote, in 1838. She was Benoit's second wife. They married in 1846, and there was a 26-year age difference between the two of them. I did not see anything about their children, whether they had children together or with their previous spouses, but one of my sources did list their grandchildren, so there you go. Mary died December 27th, 1872 in Pennsylvania, but is buried here in Kansas City. And the Women's Christian Association of Kansas City, Missouri, erected a memorial for her in Marcus Hook, Pennsylvania, at the Bible Presbyterian Church. And, okay, last thing, her portrait is hanging up in the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, so that's pretty cool. Her uncle is William Gillis. So this is her father's brother. He was born in 1797 and died in 1869. He was also born in Maryland. Um, my source said possibly his father was French and his mother was Scottish. Uh, this particular source is usually very certain um, in, in other circumstances, right? But in this particular circumstance, my source was like, we're really not certain. <laughs> According to KansasCityHistory.org, quote, An Indian trader and one of the co-founders of the town of Kansas, he was born in Maryland and fought in the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811, became a member of the tribe of Delaware Indians become, before coming to Kansas City about 1831, end quote. And, quote, Here he was among the 14 investors who plotted the original town of Kansas on the Missouri River, landing several miles north of Westport a venture now considered to have been the founding of Kansas City, Missouri. Gillis built a lavish colonial-style plantation house, which stood near today's intersection of 27th and Holly and depended upon the labor of slaves to operate his farm. So again, really not great. Which encompassed much of the area we now know as Kansas City's west side. Atop a Kansas River bluff, he built another trading post and continued his lucrative dealings with the Indians. End quote. So, William um, Gillis and Dr. Troost, they met in Kansas City and they went into business together. I'm guessing this is how Ben and Mary met. Uh, like I said, Gillis died July 19th, 1869. And after working with the railroad and trading and had a hotel and a plantation, Gillis was loaded he left his fortune to his niece, Mary. Uh, one of the sources I looked at said it was something like $2 million. 
She died a few years later in 1872. And in her will, she said, I want you to take this combined fortune and build an opera house in Kansas City. And I want the proceeds from this opera house to be used for an orphan's home. Uh, specifically, the Gillis Orphan's Home, which had been built in 1870. Alright, so I kept those bios like because I really wanted to focus on the theater. Um, all of the people behind the opera houses, Coates, Truce, Gillis, are all very fascinating. There's so much more to them than I've told you all, so I can definitely see myself doing a deep dive on all of them someday. So her will was contested. I'm guessing it was either by her children or her grandchildren. Because, hey, you're not giving us this money. We want two plus million dollars. Um, and litigation lasted ten years. But the theater was finally opened in 1883 at the corner of Fifth and Walnut. Total building cost ended up being 14... No, that's not right. Hold on. $140,000. There we go. It was four stores tall and built by... Asa Bebe Cross. It had gas and electric lighting and it could see about 2,000 people. Um, this number comes from cinematreasures.org, which is a blog. One comment on there says that it was 1,700, and another comment says it was 2,059, so I just kind of went for the middle. The interior features dazzling glass chandeliers and walnut, which is a native wood to this area. It's used in all the grand homes and buildings of this time period. It's super gorgeous. If you go into an old house that was built in the 1800s today, if they have any original wood left, and dear God, I hope they do, I can almost guarantee that it's walnut. And it shines in the sunlight, and it's just super pretty. I love it. Anyways, <laughs> sorry. Um, The theater opened September 10th, 1883. Now, I want to take a quick aside and talk about the architect, Asa, famous architect. I had no trouble finding bios for this dude. Unlike Mary, oh no, he's all over the internet. <laughs> he was born December 9th in 1826, so he and I are actually birthday buddies. It's cool. In Camden, New Jersey, his parents were Thomas B. Cross and Millicent Bebe Cross. His dad was a carpenter. After high school, he studied architecture in Philadelphia before moving to St. Louis in about 1850. He then continued to study architecture in St. Louis under Tom Walsh and John Johnson. It was also in St. Louis that he met his wife, Rachel Taylor, who was born 1838, died 1890. She was a single mother and a widow. The family moved to, and by family I mean like Cross and his wife and stepson, moved to Kansas City in 57, and he lived here until his death on August 18th, 1894. Dude was super prolific. He worked on so many buildings around Kansas City, including the Vale Mansion, which I've not covered yet, and I've never visited, but it's really, really wanted. It's been on my radar for a few years now. Quote, the old St. Patrick's Cathedral at 800 Cherry Street with its twin belfries, the Board of Trade... Oh, sorry, the old Board of Trade at 502 Delaware Street and the Pacific House Hotel at 401 Delaware Street. End quote. Just to name a few. And that is all I will say about Asa Cross for now. Definitely going to come back to him in another series. Back to the opera houses. So I started off this episode saying that Gillis and Coates Opera House were in serious competition with one another. Well... After the Coates Opera House burns down in 1901, spoilers, that's why you should listen to part one first. Um, then the Gillis Opera House becomes the premier opera house in Kansas City. But I don't want you to think that that means that there's no other competition. Um, there are still dozens and dozens of vaudeville and burlesque theaters and houses around the town. We've got movie theaters beginning to be built in the early 1900s, not to mention the like hundreds of jazz clubs, bars, and dance halls. If you haven't uh, listened to my topic on KC Jazz, you really ought to, because in that topic I talk about the golden age of jazz in the 1920s and 30s and how um, Kansas City 
it becomes a major hub, you know, beginning, you know, even before this golden age, but especially during the golden age. And did I mention bars and taverns? So many bars and taverns. We were called the wettest block in the world for a reason. Uh, if you're not sure what that means, then check out my Paris of the Plain series, specifically the topic Prohibition. So, all of that to say, Kansas Cityans have a plethora of entertainment options. Okay, the Gillis Opera House is just one of many available selections. But despite all of this, they do seem to be doing pretty well. According to my sources, they did also have nighttime burlesque shows, and it was rewired to show movies in the early 20s. But here it is, the end. The theater was, quote, mysteriously blown up in June uh, of 1925, June 25th, 1925. All of my sources said mysteriously blown up. We have no idea how this happened. Could have been an accident. They did have gas. Could have been some kind of explosion. Could have been arson. Don't know. Quote, the four-story building was leveled, and it was never known for certain how many people died in the accident because there was no accurate account of the number of people inside at the time of the explosion. Unofficial reports placed the number of dead at six, plus a fireman who was killed when a fire truck answering the alarm overturned at 9th and Walnut. There were 31 injuries that required medical attention. End quote. According to my sources, the site was rebuilt, and this new building... Fireproof brick, thank you very much, um, cost just as much as the original had. And this new building was now a rental slash storage unit with a small theater because they wanted to continue to comply with Mary's will and have a theater at this site funding the Gillis House. Burlesque shows were showed at this theater until 1941 with the start of World War II. Quote, the building continued as a retail and storage space for the next few decades. Efforts were made to revive it as a combination dinner theater and disco. Despite these efforts, the plans never reached fruition. The Gillis Building's most recent entertainment-based tenant, the River Market Brewing Company, opened in the space in the spring of 1995. End quote. The River Market Brewery ended up closing in 2009, and three years later, the Opera House Coffee and Food Emporium opened in that space. They are still open today. They are a coffee shop, bakery, and restaurant all in one. And I love the vibe of the place, but honestly, I'm sorry to say that uh, I've never had a great food experience there. The food's always been kind of lackluster. That will be all for today. Thank you for joining me as we explore this piece of Kansas City's history. As I said at the beginning of this episode, we will finish this series in the new year with the Folly Theater. Yes, been looking forward to this since like February. <laughs> Sources for this episode include uh, the blog cinematreasures.org and the website kchistory.org. Those are my main sources. I also used findagrave.com, of course, squeezeboxcity.com, um, the... Missouri State Historical Society has the archival um, boxes and information and papers and all of that for um, Cross. So I did get to read his bio on their website. And when I come back and do Cross in a deep dive, I'm definitely going to reach out to them to, to look at all those records. I also use the Missouri Valley Research Center at the Kansas City Public Library. I found an article in Pitch KC about the closing of the brewery, and I found a couple of articles about Tristan Gillis in the Martin City Telegraph. Like I said at the beginning of the show, this is the last topic I'm going to release this calendar year, and I will probably have one more Mini Sun Adventure somewhere around Christmas time, and I will definitely have my 2022 year in review on December 31st, so keep an eye out for those. I hope you will consider becoming a financial supporter of the show if you're able. There are several ways you can do so. You can subscribe to patreon.com slash homegrownkc or redcircle.com slash homegrownkc. Or you can give a one-time donation at redcircle.com slash homegrownkc or kofi, uh, sorry, I decided to call it coffee.com slash homegrownkc. That's ko-fi.com. 
You can give as little or as much as you want, even as little as $1 a month. Once you sign up, create an account, and subscribe to the show, you'll be charged that day, and then you'll be charged on the first of every month following. If you become a patron supporter, you get three things. One, you get an item from the merchandise store valued at $5 or less. You get a shout-out on every episode and social media post. So thank you, Bjorn, Gina, and Joan for your continued support. And you get access to exclusive bonus content featuring other local historians, archivists, and museum curators. Everyone who simply donates will receive a shout-out on the next available episode, but you will not get access to the bonus content, and you will not get anything from the merchandise store. Currently, I have a Patreon episode, Redline KC, which I mentioned at the beginning of the show, available to all of my listeners. That will become a Patreon exclusive on January 1st, 2023. So make sure to listen to it before then, or become a Patreon and listen to it whenever you want. Additionally, if you donate on coffee, 1% automatically goes to help fight climate change. If you cannot support me monetarily, you can still support me by following and subscribing to my Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, and Tumblr pages, also my YouTube channel. I am Homegrown KC on all of those. And make sure you rate and review me wherever you listen, but especially on Apple Podcasts. You can visit my website for additional information on each topic. That's homegrownkc.wordpress.com. And you can sign up for my newsletter there. Like I said before, I will be sending that out this afternoon. You're not going to get an email every month. On, or You will get an email every month, if I don't forget again. You will not receive one every day. I'm not going to spam you. That's really annoying. But this is a really great way for you to stay current with announcements and episode alerts. In the future, I might do some giveaways. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or episode suggestions, you can email me at homegrownkcpodcast at gmail.com, or you can slide into one of my DMs. You can visit zazzle.com slash store slash homegrown underscore kc underscore store to see what merchandise is available. Again, that's zazzle, Z-A-Z-Z-L-E dot com slash store slash homegrown underscore kc underscore store. Thank you goes out to my talented sister-in-law, Sarah McCombs, for the creation of my logo. To the Dear Misses for the use of their song, Kansas City, as the intro and outro music of the show. To local libraries, which enable me to gather all my research. And to you. Be kind to one another. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. Happy Yule. Happy Solstice. Happy St. Nicholas Day. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Las Posadas. And any other holiday I forgot, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for listening. Cheers. seem to shake this feeling and I can seem to get you off my mind